for. Council. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I don't ever, ever want you to forget the name of Mary Sue Brooks. I want the last thing on your deathbed and the accomplishments when you think of them and you list them off is that in the case of the state of Texas against Billy Chumirmir, where Mary Sue Brooks was the victim, that you did the right thing. That will be part of your legacy. Don't ever forget the name Mary Sue Brooks. If you today, at the end of the day today, when you go to bed, start to forget the name of Billy Chumirmir, that is fine. But don't ever, ever forget name Mary Sue Brooks. That is what we're here about today. You know, the way this system works is everything that you've seen me use here and all this, all of this, I have to give to them first. And they've had it forever. I have to deliver everything to them. They don't have to return anything to me and tell me anything. Now, they don't know what I'm going to argue. I'm sure they've guessed and guessed somewhat well, but misplaced. I don't know what they're going to say when they get up to argue. Did you see a flurry of me trying to change this PowerPoint? And I don't know if you all have ever used PowerPoint. It takes a while to put it together. Did you see me change one thing on my computer as they spoke? No. And what do I want to start with is Mary Sue Brooks. I am not going to ever ask you to forget that case. And there is a part of me in figuring out how to present this to the 14 of you all that thinks I should have probably just stopped with the evidence of Mary Sue Brooks and closed this case out on Monday and let you deliberate and come back with a verdict of guilty. Because when you saw the evidence linking Mr. Chamirmir being at that Walmart that day, parking exactly next to her, and driving out at the exact moment in time that she is driving out, and the next day having a unique ring, a cherished heirloom of her family in his possession, do you need anything more? Does that case stand on itself, by itself? Is that not enough? When you add to that, his device is at Walmart and then follows in the same direction as her house to her house for 45 minutes. What is he doing in there for 45 minutes? He killed her and then he went through her things methodically calculated in the middle of the day with no care whatsoever as to what may or may not come across him. In a community of however many houses in there, of other people, a close-knit community, her grandson lives down the way. Not a care in the world goes through her items. Don't ever forget a Mary Sue Brooks. And we don't need any help, but justice does. Justice needs your help, and that's what you're here for. I can't do it by myself. The Plano Police Department, the Richardson Police Department, the Dallas, but the FBI, they can't do it without you. That's the help we need here. Well, who is Mary Sue Brooks? You heard about her. Her daughter thought she was funny. She loved to have meals. She loved to bring her family together, this close-knit family. Her grandson, her daughter lived next to her before she passed away. Her grandson allowed to live there, a young couple, starting out in line. And yet they still want to spend time with their grandmother. Dinners, meetings, no poppins. But dinners, fun times. I'll never forget Mary Sue Brooks. Now, can I tell, though, really and truly, how we get to solving Mary Sue Brooks without these other women, without their tragic story, sisters connected, in one horrible, horrible story? connected by that man. Maybe they would have been friends in life, I don't know. But unfortunately their connection now is through Billy Chamirmir. And I cannot 
tell the story of Mary Sue Brooks without really getting into these other stories. Why? Because we know that this is how she is found. And yes, that night, a trained police officer found no signs on that body that would lead him to believe that foul play. Well, guess what? A doctor, a medical examiner trained in these things looked at the body of Martha Williams, two of them, and they didn't see any signs either. What does that tell you about the craft, about the ability of Billy Chamirmir to take two women to put his hands on them and to leave them without a trace, without a trace. But what happens the next day? Hey, where's her ring? Where's her safe? Where's the other items that we, what happened to them? Richardson Police Department, what's going on? We, we can't find these things. Can you help us out? They wait three weeks to drill the box. They're not in there either. They knew something just wasn't right about that. Martha Williams family told me the same thing. We knew something just wasn't right. There were things missing. Mary Bartell told you in her own words things were missing. These stories overlap. You cannot know one without the other. They did do some investigation, though. They tell, they figured out she was at Walmart. Her things, her groceries thawed. We know what day had happened because of the, the, the blood uh, pressure. Pad. We know exactly what was happening with her on the 30th. Do not forget Mary Sue Brooks. Mary Bartell, it goes, Mary, Mary, Mary Brooks's case goes cold, right? They don't know. They don't, they don't know that they have a guy like Billy Chamira that's capable of doing this until we meet Barry, Mary Bartell. And Mary Bartell is able to tell you that, yes, I was at my house. I was doing my normal routine. Go to church. Come home. Eat a little bit. I made a phone call to my sister, uh, sister-in-law. I was sending an email. There's a rapping on my door. The same routine I have every day. I get up. I go eat. I go have exercise. I take a little nap. And then I do my afternoon act activities. Right? These are individuals that have a routine. The routine that Billy Shemirman is looking for. Remember? He was at her apartment just a few days before that. Watching. Learning. Scoping out like a hunter would. She tells you that her ring, a ring that she had on her hand for 50 years, given to her by her husband, a, a, a sign of love, a sign of admiration, something that should be passed down to her sons, to her daughters, gone. Well, the Plano Police Department goes to work on this attack of this elderly woman. And they talk to the, the uh, age of the, the 5,000 old shepherd at Preston Place. They get a, a, a suspicious person a few days before, Richard Plain. We have a license plate. They go to work on the license plate. Well, this license plate of this car that's doing all of this stuff is in someone else's name. Tom Omdane's name. How clever is that? Let's get a car that looks like every other car out there, like Mr. Warren says. And let's put it in someone else's name so that when I'm doing all my stuff, no one's ever going to come back and look at me. Okay? They get a name, they get, uh, but fortunately, he wrecked out in that car a couple of days before. So they have an accident report. They have his name. They have his address. They are able to figure out his phone number. And so they go to work on that. You hear from the detectives. All of these detectives are sitting up waiting for Billy Chamirmir to show up at his house. The best place they think they can find him where he's expected to be, back home. It's the next day, the 21st. And when they get there, sure enough, here comes Billy Chamirmer after having passed by his spot, going to the dumpster and uh, uh, getting out of his car and getting back in and parking. He doesn't want to get out of the car, remember that? He's shocked, he cannot believe it. Finally, the game is up. The police have, have got their man, the game is up. They have to get him out of the car, they put him down. In his hand are these items, right here in front of you, a hat, some gloves, uh, a hat, a, a phone, jewelry, unique jewelry in his hand. They go back to the dumpster. What do they find? A jewelry box. Inside that jewelry box, they find unique items. Names, a Lou T. Bang here. Uh, 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 things that would 
police officers take to use and to investigate. This is now the Plano Police Department. What the Plano Police Department doesn't know in their investigation of their Plano case is that they're helping to solve a Dallas case. Because we get the name, we get the, the name tag, they go to work on it. There's only really one other Lou T. Bang that really, that really matches this, and it's Lou T. Harris. And so now we're introduced to her tragic story. And when they follow down to where she lives at 6609 Warm Breeze, their fears are met and the revelation is had that inside that house, lo and behold, a dead woman. Billy Chimirmir, they just happen to stumble across. Billy Chimirmir at his house, they just happen to stumble across that he has things in his possession that belong to another dead woman. When, what else does he have on him? The keys to her house. Let me ask you this. As an aside, why do you think he kept the keys to the house? He threw out everything else he didn't want. And yet he kept the keys to her house. How much comfort must there be in his mind that maybe there's a time I can actually go head back there to that house full of all of that stuff? You've met through Rick Reiner, Lou T. Bang. And she, he told you about this jewelry that she's wearing on there, this unique bracelet, this green ring. You see it there? You see that ring on her hand? And this bracelet on her wrist? Right there. It's the same one. Unique items. Treasures to her and to her family. Items of just greed to Mr. Tremere. They know the story of Mary Bartell. So what do they go and look at and find and discover, not knowing that it's there? The Dallas Police Department? A pillow with a, with a smear on it that matches her mouth and her lipstick. I can't tell Mary Sue Brooks' story without this, without you understanding what he does and how he does it. The same day, the same day that that, 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 that pillow is getting collected, in Plano, another pillow is getting collected. A pillow belonging to Martha Williams. Another stain. The consistency, the pattern, it's overwhelming. Now we introduce Martha Williams, another woman, loved by her family moved in a couple of uh, less than a year before from her own house to a nice safe community where she thought she could live out the rest of her days in comfort with other individuals who were just like her. What she didn't know was that Billy Tamir was casing that place and hangs out there. We find her on March 7th, but we know that it was March 4th was the day that she passed away. How do we know that? Because of her medication, because of the communications that, that, that failed on that day, because of her receipt, because of her, her car. When they go back and look at this pillow, unbeknownst to, oh, while we're on this subject of uh, Detective Turbiarte, do you know how long I spent and how much time I spent bringing you all the pictures of everything and how it was, how it was uh, collected? I brought you everybody. That, that came in here and collected every piece of evidence and how it was all, all these pictures, how they were taken and how they were brought over and they were untampered and unmessed with when they got to the UNT lab. Why? Because I kind of figured, well, they're probably going to say, even though we didn't need a subpoena, because they could have brought Detective Turby Arte if they thought anything was wrong about it. It's an objective shift in the burden, Judge. Their burden for their case. I'm proving it, Judge. That's overruled, and you may continue. Ladies and gentlemen, closing arguments are just that. It is not evidence from either side. You may continue. Ladies and gentlemen, his DNA is on this pillow. It has no business being on in her house. They go back, they look at her fingernails. He, he, they cannot be excluded as a contributor to the fingernails on there. The blood stain on that pillow, the, the, uh, the, the DNA under there, what did Holland Williams tell you? Her mom's a fighter. What did Dr. Bernard tell you? This would be a struggle. This would be something that people would, would reach out and lash out for and try to gain breath, try to, try to do whatever they can. These women had lived these long lives 
through all kinds of, 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 of issues and things. And there was pandemics before this. There was, uh, there was uh, wars that they lived through. And yet, when we would expect that their final days would be of rest and comfort, no, it's struggling. It's struggling for, a, for the last breath that they will ever take because Billy Chimera has a pillow over their face, scratching him, collecting his DNA from him. They go and look in this car. They collect the car a year later. This car was in the Dallas Police Department. Plano Police Department goes and gets it, looks inside it. The first time ever, you find gloves in a glove box, right? No one ever keeps gloves in a glove box, but here he does. And when we look at this one unique glove, this blue glove, it's got her DNA on it to the, to the 1 in 130 octillion. Her DNA in his glove box. And what does that tell you? That confirms Mary Bartell. What does that tell you? Why do we not have fingerprints in anybody else's house? They ask about, did you collect any fingerprints in any of these? Why? You can't leave fingerprints when you got a glove on. Mary Bartell tells you he has gloves. Martha Williams convinces you that he has gloves. Is it not too crazy to think that in Mary Brooks' case, he wore gloves as well? Why don't we have a pillow from Mary Brooks's case? I told you, she's found on January 30th first. They don't go back to look at her case until March, after March 20th, when he's, the, when he's discovered as this killer. Those pillows are already gone. They're already, they're, there's nothing to compare him to. We don't even know which one it was. He's, she's in the living room. They look inside the trunk of, of, uh, of, his, of his car, inside this blue bag right here. And what else do they find? You don't want to believe DNA? You think there's something wrong with the DNA in this case? Well, look inside here. Unique items. This bowl. Creamer. This creamer. A wedding gift, she believes to her mom, lived with her mom for all those years. Now, something to be carried around in the trunk of Billy Chamirmir's car, something to be got for, something to be earned, his earning, his job, that's part of his job right there. Let's go back to the investigation, one being done by the Plano Police Department, and one being done by the Dallas Police Department almost simultaneously. They have two different cases that they're working on. One's trying to solve Lou Harris. The other one's trying to solve Mary Bartell. So let's start with Lou Harris's, okay? And they have this, this Walmart receipt. Well, let's go get some, some video of Walmart. Let's see what we find. Hey, we found Lou Harris, right? Well, let's see if there's anything else in there. What do we find? Billy Chamirmir, the same guy. Just minutes before checking out, you remember the other videos where he's walking up, looking down her aisle, coming back, and then checking out, and, and waiting, and waiting, and waiting, and then right together. So they go and get more video, right? And what does this do? The Dallas Police Department gets more video that helps the Richardson Police Department. Is this a big, big conspiracy? Do we get Dallas, and Richardson, and Plano, and the FBI, and the UNT lab? Everybody to just, let's just all go frame Billy Chamirmir all of a sudden. No. They are following the evidence as I would ask you to follow the evidence. And what do we find? At 1051, 53, Mary, Bar Mary Brooks is walking into that Walmart and unbeknownst to her, over her left shoulder, sitting in that Altima that we showed you the video of, is Billy Chamirmir. Sitting there. Right there. Remember that? Remember, this is from earlier. Remember, he was at that Walmart three times that day. First he came, he parked, he walked in, looked over, turned around, got back in his car, and then left. Then he comes back again and parks at this time and sits there. He goes inside. Remember, he has the exchange with the woman. He goes inside. He buys an orange, a Lunchable, and sits there for about an hour. Facing what? Facing these parking, the, the, the handicapped parking spots, his favorite little hunting spot. We know that was the same day that she died. Why? Because she's wearing the same clothes, right?
You can see here, this is him pulling in. He's gonna wind up parking right next to Mary Brooks. And then this is him leaving that spot. No, that's not working. Anyhow, you know he parks right there. That same Nissan Altima. And this is her. She's parked. She's right next to him. When she pulls out, he pulls out. Why do you think he likes this Walmart? What do you think it is about this Walmart? Well, there he is on his phone. Look who's right behind it. There he is walking in, looking over. Here he is walking in again at another time. Who does he see? Walking in again, coming right out against it. Again, looking over. You've seen all these videos. You've seen what he is looking for. These women, each time. That's his hunting ground. You remember this exchange with this woman here? When he comes in this... Uh, You'll remember it. You remember how they had that exchange and he helps her with the basket and he gets his stuff, uh, the trash out for her and she pats him, pats him on the shoulder. That's a, do you remember what Mary Martell told you? He spoke elder ease. Right? She knew, he knew exactly how to do it. How do you think he gets into these houses? How do you think he's able to communicate and look and, and, and interact in these different environments without being seen and without being noticed? He's practiced his craft and his training. They want to say that this was, a, in Mary Brooks' case, that maybe she invited him in, this stranger, into her house, and then just said, here, take all my stuff. Maybe that's how this became not a burglary. Well, ladies and gentlemen, once you're in there and you put someone down on their ground and you put a pillow over their face or you do some sort of homicidal violence to them, that is a burglary at that point in time. That's, that's just a misstatement of the That law. is not a misstatement of the law. That is a misstatement of the law. Uh, gentlemen, the gentlemen, charge. one person, black woman. So your uh, legal objection raises? Well, he's misstating the law. Right. The law is what's in the charge, and the jury's entitled to rely on that law and not his interpretation of it. And uh, to that, I will... Um, Saying that objection, Mr. Fitzmartin, will stick to that law that's in charge. If you commit, if you get into someone's house and you enter that house in the, with the intent to commit theft or with the intent to commit uh, some sort of other felony offense, that is a burglary. That, that's not what it says in the law. That's it's just not. He, he can't leave out half the law and ask them to apply. It. I've already ruled, however, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you will have a copy of the court's charge to read all of the instructions as well as all of the law that is given to you by the court. Uh, as I've told you before, this is summation. This is summation. You will recall all the evidence and testimony that you heard in this case. Uh, Mr. Fitzmartin, you can continue, and I'll give you some minutes back. Thank you, Judge. Ladies and gentlemen, do not forget Mary Brooks. Do not forget, oh, let me talk about Mary Bartell. When we go uh, to uh, Mary Bartell, remember I told you that, that, that Dallas is working on Walmart? Well, uh, Plano's working on Mary Bartell's case. The offer up records, okay? They get the offer up records to try to prove Mary Bartell's case. And sure enough, it does, because she signs that, that piece of paper right there that says that that is her ring, this ring she had for 50 years. Then we see that we track that, and he's selling that ring down at Starbucks to Abdel Saleh. What do they do when they look inside those same records? They find Mary Brooks's ring, the same ring that her grandmother, or that her mother owned, that Ann Brooks's grandmother owned, the same ring that was soldered underneath. That Ann Brooks says, "I know for a fact that is mine." We brought in William Noble, the owner of the company, to say that ring and that ring is the exact same ring. We brought you records from Diamond and Gold Exchange. You remember the pattern? The pattern and all these things? He would go attack someone and then go directly to uh, Diamond and Gold Exchange. March 4th, on the left, that is the day he goes in for Martha Williams, getting about $3,000. March the 19th, that is Mary Bartell, 105, having just gotten $380 from Abdel Saleh. 
What do we have on the on the 30th and the 31st? Also selling Mary Brooks's items at Diamond and Gold Exchange for a little over $5,000. That's the worth that this man believes that these ladies' lives are. Don't you think all of these women would have given him that money if they needed to? Just for maybe one more day, one more meal, one more breath? Absolutely. This is him, smiling, the day of Martha Williams. He just did a good day's work that day. He just put that pillow right there over her face. If we had cameras in the parking lot, we'd find that Ultima in the glove box, those gloves with Martha Williams' DNA on it. These items here in the, in the trunk. I can't tell you the story of these, three, these four sisters without, I can't tell you Mary Brooks without telling you about Mary Bartell. I can't tell you Lou Harris without telling you about Mary Bartell. I can't tell you Martha Williams without Mary Martell and Mary Brooks. They have been intertwined in the web that, that Billy Chamirmir has cast. I don't need your help. The evidence doesn't need your help. I just need your common sense. That's all I need. And when you put all of this evidence together, you know exactly what happened. Billy Chamirmir. Billy Chamimir is what happened and brought this death and this destruction to these families' lives. You know, I'll be, I'll be a lawyer 25 years in November, and I, I've spent every day of it down here. And these are the laws that we live by, and I do encourage you to read that court's charge and, 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 and see that, that we have filled out every part of what we're supposed to prove to you here today. But you know, the laws that are in here that prohibit things, they're all pretty much driven by the, same, by the seven deadly sins. You've all heard of those. You know, sloth, um, uh, envy, pride, rage. That's pretty much what it comes down to. Billy's, Mr. Tamirmir's, it's greed. That's his seven deadly sins. And you know, when you think of some of those like rage or lust or gluttony or whatever, some of those might, might be brought on by some sort of uh, mental condition. You know, maybe it doesn't excuse something, but it might explain it. There's no real explanation for greed. You know, you can, it's the difference between greed and just wanting more, wanting a better life. Okay, that's what this country is built on, is wanting more and wanting a better life. People come here from far away. You've heard of them here. Luke Harris, Tom Ondey, <coughs> Abdel Saleh, Yulad Nisanoff. They've come here to, to carve out a career, carve out a life for themselves. And maybe that's what first brought Mr. Chamirmir to our, our country. But then the greed took over. And greed's different. Greed makes things like humans turn into objects. You know, you've heard of the Midas touch. Everybody's heard of that. Well, that old story is about old King Midas. Old King Midas, he, he, he did, a, he did a, a, a good deed for a god and gave him a wish. And he said, you know what, I'd like to be able to touch something and make it turn to gold. And he was so excited when he got that wish. And, you know, he, but soon that greed started to turn back on him. The, the meal that he ate turned to gold, and the, and the cup that he drank turned to gold, not taking that pleasure from him. The, the roses in his garden all turned to gold, which brought him joy at first, but what happened to his daughter? His daughter didn't like that she couldn't smell the roses anymore, and he touched his daughter, killing her daughter, turning her to gold. Well, ladies and gentlemen, now you, you have a new touch, the Chimirmir touch. This touch turns everything to death, to ruin. He takes these pillows, these objects that should be our, our, our comfort, things that should be, you know, we use to decorate our houses, that these women probably use to, to, to bring comfort to their life and to their, to their house, to give them rest, to give them respite. But what does he do with them? He turns them into objects of murder, objects of greed. Death follows the touch of Billy Chamirmir. When he touches these items that you see, these heirlooms, these things that should be passed down from generation to generation, they now become things of just objects to him. Do you really think that anybody wants this creamer anymore? The thing that was given as a wedding gift, but now was the object of someone's desire to the point where he's willing to kill her for it. That court, the, the ring of her grandmother, Ann Brooks' grandmother, that she wore for a week, melted down, sold off for measly dollars. 
That's the touch of Billy Chamirmir. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't want you to ever forget Mary Brooks. I don't want you to ever forget any of these women. They deserve you. Giving them the attention, giving them your consideration, but they also deserve a quick and just verdict. Every minute, you, when you go back there and you take this charge and you read through this charge if you need to, and you come back to maybe you decide who your four person is, there is only one place that your four person should sign, and it is this top line here. It doesn't, it's, although he did commit theft, you don't sign that, and it's definitely not found guilty. It's just a capital murder. That's what this case calls for. Because justice calls for that. Not because of what I say or he says or anybody else says. It's because that's how the evidence has led you. Billy Chamirma turned these women's lives into his objects of desire and greed and cast them away. Do not cast me away when I am old. Do not forsake me when my strength is gone. These words uttered in the book of Psalms thousands of years ago ring true to today. Our elderly, the most vulnerable of our society, along with maybe children, deserve our protection, deserve to be told your lives meant something. And the police departments in this North Texas community came together and provided the evidence we needed to hold you, Mr. Chairman, Chairman accountable for your actions. And every minute, every second, you delay your verdict in this case gives that, him I mean, hope. That's, that's, that's improper here. The argument and, and trying to shift the burden, um, we just ask him to keep it, his argument from improper bound. Objection overruled. You may continue. You have one minute left. Thank you, Judge. A swift, swift verdict on your part will take any hope that he has away from him that someday he might walk free again. Someday that he might be able to go back to 5,000 Old Shepherd or go back to that Walmart. Take that hope away from him, just like he took all hope away from these women, just like he took the breath away from these women. Return a verdict of guilty because he is guilty. Send a message to this community that the citizens of Dallas County will do what is right. They'll do what is just, and they'll do it in a swift manner and send a message far and wide that Billy Chamirmir is a capital murderer just as he set out to be. Thank you.